So my name's uh, Leslie Carr. Um, I'm here at the University of Southampton. I, um, I'm one of the uh, directors of the uh, doctoral training centre in web science. Um, and the responsibility of that is to, uh, is to do research and to, to get PhD students who are looking at the impact of the, the World Wide Web on society. Uh, and so that's come, come out of my interest in open access uh, over the last decade or so, and looking at how the web has so profoundly impacted the potential for scholarly communications, um, and uh, taking a step back uh, and, and looking at how that can improve science, uh, and, uh, but how we all have to change and change our practices to do that. Uh, and also, I'm a, a repository manager here for, for our school's uh, um, publication outputs. The benefits of open access uh, accrue to lots of different people and the exciting thing for us I think has been seeing the way that happens um, not just you know so for, for one different set of stakeholders um, but uh, seeing the benefits coming out again and again and again in different cases uh, and so you know we see uh, this perhaps uh, you know for for researchers, you know, because that, you know, that's what the, the message is about open access, that other researchers will be able to access our research. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we put on each page um, in our repository, we, uh, we have um, some graphs which show the, the use and the, the number of downloads of a particular um, piece of research of the PDFs of the paper or whatever um, over time for, so that people can, people can see that and they can, they can see how it's gone. Um, we report that back to our, uh, to our academics in their research committee so that the senior management get a good idea about just the, the usefulness and the, the impact in that sense uh, uh, of uh, our combined research and how you know sort of that's being in a sort of month on month, term on term, year on year, um, that's, that's, that's coming out and that's being expressed. Um, but also we see that just in the reports that we get back from individual people, so from our marketing manager saying that we've made contact with people in, you know, in different companies because they Googled for us and they found out about our research and that led them to looking about information about particular researchers and particular projects, which led them to our school and so on and so on. And we hear that about you know, people who are applying for PhDs, uh, are people who are applying for, uh, for d doing their, their undergraduate degrees. Um, and so we get reports back like this. These aren't necessarily things where um, we have, you know, sort of hard data and metrics. But you know, sort of when these, when this material comes back and filters back to individuals, it's the importance of anecdote really over analytics. So you use what analytical tools you have, and perhaps that might be Google Analytics, or it might be something that the repository does itself, as I just described. But also you just make sure that people hear about all the little successes um, that they're getting and, uh, and all the times that people, uh, you know, sort of come to them and say, I saw your research and that's why, you know, I'm interested, whether it's um, an undergraduate or whether it's a, you know, potential benefactor from, from industry. Well, we've done a number of studies on the relationship between citations and downloads and open impact. And you can show those things in kind of very general, uh, large, broad-based studies. And we've done, done a number of those um, on various uh, pieces of literature, um, uh, parts of the literature. So, for example, particularly for physics literature, where you've got a very large proportion of literature made, made open access and available. Um, other people have done lots of uh, lots of these studies as well, and we keep a, an up to date um, bibliography on our uh, on our sites uh, on, e on on our ePrints homepage to show off to people the fact that you know sort of that that there is a lot of benefit to be gained from making material open access. Now, um, when it comes to individuals, you can find you can find people who say. Um, I put my uh, papers up into the repository and then, you know, a year later I saw 
you know, sort of citations start to accrue, you know. Um, but for many people, it's just, uh, it, it's, not that, it's not that straightforward. Some people, you know, will report that they have, uh, as well as citations, people citing their work, you know, they're getting invitations to come and speak. Um, and, uh, and so finding messages that, 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 that speak to individual people are, are important. Of course, um, I think to people who are established as researchers and research practice and their methodologies, you know, to them, the idea that the web and, and reading things on the web could influence citations is, is all, seems all to be a bit mystical. But to people who grew up with the web and, you know, the much younger researchers, it all seems to be a bit obvious, you know, that how else are people going to read these things? How are people going to cite me unless they've, unless they've read my work? You know, and so, uh, and so we um, we do um, show people in our repository. Uh, we show them both the number of downloads a paper has got and the number of citations uh, that are being reported uh, uh, by Google Scholar and by um, Thompson ISI. Our school is. I was going to say our school is a special case. Of course, every school is a special case, and that's one of the real challenges of open access. It's the fact that you can't, uh, that although there are some general lessons to be drawn, you actually have to approach each school, each discipline, each sub-discipline as you know on their own terms and find out what their cultural expectations are. So our cultural expectations within a school of electronics and computer science, these are people who are very technology friendly, very technology savvy and so it doesn't take much to encourage them to you know sort of to use a computer to use a web browser to to put their to, to put their work up um, online and certainly for the students this is a this is quite a natural um, phenomenon we don't have a, a disciplinary history of worrying about the internet you know computer scientists of course who have been using the internet, you know, sort of since its early days, and with FTP and putting postscripts of their printed papers up, um, and so to them the issue of you know sort of of sharing and privacy and, and you know, the worry about their academic work is much less. So we have we don't have um, a a deliberate advocacy program within our school. Uh, what we do have is a legacy of um, the, the kind of pioneering policy work from a decade ago that people like Tony Hay and Professor Wendy Hall did with our department where they said, where they kind of converted us to open access um, uh, and gave us a policy of open access um, almost overnight. Um, and so after working that in for uh, a, a year or, or more, it's pretty much been automatic or down it, or you know, sort of people are, are, are much more happy to follow that. It took a number of years to get to that position. And I've had professors come up to me and tell me, over my dead body will I use your repository. And then come back six months later and say, actually, it's very useful, isn't it? Um, and so that kind of, you know, sort of that kind of ability to, to work with people and let them find their own time within you know, a supportive senior management has it, actually been uh, uh, really good for us. And I, you know, not everyone is going to be lucky enough to find that. It all goes back to the beginning of the, uh, what became the Open Archiving Initiative. Uh, and so we had some money from JISC as part of a project under the um, electronic international uh, digital libraries um, uh, funding to uh, to run a, a project with um, Cornell on you know, looking at um, making uh, a citation effectively an early citation database um, and so the very first thing we did as that was to go to this meeting that the archive, as they were called then, um, or the Los Alamos archive, which is now archive.org, the physics um, uh, preprint archive, were, were running um, in uh, Los Alamos, where they were trying to get together all the people who had these large 
um, subject-based repositories. So the, the physics people, e economists, um, cognitive scientists, you know, sort of various people from all over the place. And they say, well, how can we stop building these silos? How can we do something there where we can freely exchange this information? Um, and this was in 1999, so it was before, you know, sort of Google had come and it was, it was very, uh, very popular. Um, and, uh, and we just, the idea for a technical way of sharing all this information came up. But at this meeting, um, it was very obvious that we needed to expand the, the list of people who were able to participate. So we put up our hands, Stephen Harnand and, and I, and we said, well, we will... Um, create a piece of software that other institutions, other universities, other departments can use to make up their own collections that they can share using this same, same infrastructure. And that's where ePrints was born. Um, and since then, you know, sort of it's, uh, well, I mean, that, that's over 10 years ago now. ePrints is 10 years old, a decade. Um, and we have kind of moved through the idea of institutional repositories and um, and the whole, you know, this is even before the, the, the phrase open access had re reached common acceptance. And so we've used this to create institutional repositories across the world's piece of open source software, um, uh, which we invite people to use uh, to uh, make open access for their research outputs, their teaching outputs, uh, for data, for multimedia, for all sorts of intellectual items that they, that they want to use. There have been a large number of, uh, of JISC funded projects that people across the UK, for example, have been, uh, have been creating new add-ons and, and new features. We've been very lucky um, that, uh, so, so for example, groups uh, of people from arts institutions have, been, have uh, specifically looked at how to make open access work in the arts community. And so they've made their own extensions. Um, you know, we've been part of that, we're lucky to be in part of that project. Um, that are, are related to that particular kind of community um, and uh, you know, other communities similarly, teaching and learning communities as well. Um, and so there have been a lot of those. In fact, one of the things that we're just about to, to, um, uh, to open up to the public, we're just working on it at the moment, is the idea of the, what we're calling at the moment the ePrints Bazaar. It's sort of like a, an app store thing that people have been used to with their phones, but for repositories. So that repository managers, instead of having to, uh, you know, sort of download and install code, and, you know, sort of type commands on the command line uh, and have that, that kind of technical infrastructure that they have to do, they can actually just go to a page on the web, press a button, to, you know, have a look at this, you know, a particular extension, a particular plugin. So, oh, I like the idea of that. I'd like to have that on my repository. Press an install button and it will be downloaded and installed for them. So we're looking at trying to make it a lot easier to do that. And we hope that that means that you know, sort of lots of the projects that people have been running will, will find a much easier way to disseminate their work and to, you know, the innovations they've made, the, the new features that they've put on will be, you know, sort of able to reach sort of universities all around the world much, that much more effectively. What everyone wants to see, of course, is that you know, sort of the the, the usage uh, of the the repository as as high as possible. And so I'm always you know, so when our technical infrastructure people for our school, our university, publish data about you know sort of who's got the biggest web server or where all the data is or where all the downloads are coming. I'm always kind of comparing that to it. So making those kind of facilities available. So, um, and some people I know use uh, Google Analytics um, to be able to chart that at, you know, every month and to report that back. Uh, other people uh, are using facilities that they've got in the, um, the repository themselves. Now, um, when it comes to what what can the repository manager do to make that easier, um, I think that it, it's really a matter of choosing the right set of 
um, ways, the right set of ways of showing um, benefit that, that, that chime with your institutional management. So if your institutional management, you know, sort of, if, you know, what they want to see is raw numbers about how many people, you know, sort of are visiting our branded pages, you know, are coming into our, you know, sort of to read information about our repository, then, you know, sort of show them that. Um, I remember one thing that I that I did, which was very simple, was to, I, I noticed that our repository we had um, was just looked like any other ePrints repository. I mean, it, we kind of put the, the the school branding on it a bit so that it had that in there. But um, when I looked at all the other web pages of the school, they uh, and of the university, they're all full of adverts asking people to you know sort of come here to apply for our. PhDs, or you know, to if you if you're interested in doing a degree with us, and so I put those, just those panels of HTML onto our repository, and then we had the report within days that the number of uh, people who were visiting our MSc application form online had doubled, you know, and so being able just being able to show people that the repository can be involved in those effects doesn't it's not terribly complicated it's just understanding what is important to your management and trying to figure out how the repository could do that hopefully the repository software has been designed in such a way that google can crawl it very easily and so google uh, Google gives some um, guidelines on their site about how repositories can be, you know, sort of should be structured to to do that. Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, sort of ePrints is one of the repository platforms where they say if you're using, you know, ePrints, then this is well structured and you can, you know, that's well. So you don't need to do search engine optimization for those, um, but. You know, the principles of search engine optimization are really good to bear in mind. So, for example, if you want people to come to you, then put the full texts in, for heaven's sake. Make things open access. Because if you just have a, you know, a bibliographic page with the abstract in, there's less content there for Google to index and less to pull people into your website so just make so open access actually is one of the primary things that you can do to make your uh, to make your repository more visible to make your site more visible also to make sure that people to, to make sure that people are taking the opportunity to link in to your repository from other places and so offer you know that as a as a facility or as a service or make sure that you're looking out for opportunities for that to happen We've been doing this for a decade, as I said, and my hair has got greyer um, as, I, as I've done this. Um, we've been very lucky to have a very supportive management team, um, but um, it, it still is the, the case that you have to keep plodding on because there's always something else going on. When we are working with open access, you don't have the luxury of just saying, oh, I'm going to think about open access and nothing else. All of a sudden in the UK, you know, research assessment comes along as a major topic. And so you have to think, how can I offer, you know, sort of my repository as a way of solving some of the senior management's pro problems. And, you know, and so we've done that. We say, oh, look, you can, you can get people to make their, their choices of their research papers using the repository. Wouldn't that, wasn't that fantastic? And within our institution, when faced with the, the issue of either writing a piece of software to collect all this information from 6,000 researchers or using the repository and letting it do it for them you know the the appropriate the appropriate managers saw that you know they could make life easier for themselves if they went with the repository so that was that was an example of something where just being flexible understanding what your institution's concerns are and trying to respond to them and offer them as a, as a service um, is really useful so my message to, to, to someone who's taking this up is um, you really need to just keep going. You know, uh, there's always 
uh, you don't have the option of just saying, oh, look, I, I did that. Uh, I pressed the button. I did, I, I did those things. That's fine. There's always another challenge to be undertaken, always another part of academia who's got the, uh, another part of the of pro of the business processes of your institution um, where they're saying help how can we do this and you can say oh you know sort of the repository can help you out here um, uh, so that you keep the repository you know sort of central in the in the institution's mind really so just just keep going and keep working with people um, and understand that different people, whether they're administrators or researchers or students or librarians, have different views uh, and opinions about how you should be doing your job. So it's hard work, but it's very rewarding.